Welcome to Smartphone Photography. My name is Danny K. Johnson. I am with the UVic Library's Digital Scholarship Commons. First of all, the more you understand light, the stronger your photography will be. If you spend some time around avid photographers, you'll hear phrases like, look at that light, or we were chasing light that evening, or they'll talk about the quality of light. And photography is essentially using a digital sensor or photographic film and exposing it to enough light to record an image. Light has a variety of colors and the type of light hitting your subject will change the tones of your photo. For example, fluorescent light often has a green tone to it, especially older fluorescent lights. They've gotten better in modern times. Shade light usually ranges from blue to purple tones. And so oftentimes if you take photos that are in the shade or indoors in indirect light, it'll be cooler in tone than photos taken in the sun or um, under um, artificial lighting. And uh, sunset, the light outdoors is rapidly changes, changing from a soft golden hue to a rich golden orange. And photographers call this the golden hour. And then it slowly goes into a blue tone as the sun drops down below the horizon and photographers call this the blue hour and the light during this time is uh, very beautiful for photographs. Light can also change color if it is filtering through something such as a red patio umbrella or bouncing off an object before hitting your subject, such as a green wall, so it can bounce off the, the, the colored object and maybe hit the side of someone's face and maybe their skin will look green. You need to pay attention to what light is hitting your subject and too many light sources can result in mixed light, which is usually unflattering. An example here of light temperature and exposure, the sensor can get tricked by what it sees and it is up to us to intervene and correct it when necessary to get the best results. In this example, there is a large black cookie sheet that uh, the sensor sees all the darkness and thinks that it's in a dark space, so it needs to bring up the exposure. And so what happens is the, the container that the strawberries are in is overexposed, and so you have what's called blown out highlights here, which is a loss of detail that you can't end up fixing later. So there's no pixels in, in the edge of this container here. Also, the light in the kitchen is on. And so you've got some orange light bulb light hitting here. And there's a window open here that has some shade light coming in. And so there's a blue light here. So you've got two contrasting colors, color temperatures of light hitting the subject and then overexposure. And so you end up with a lot of mixed light here and it's a little bit unappealing. In contrast over here, what I've done is, all I've done is I've turned off the overhead light. So there's only one color temperature of light coming in and that's coming in from the window, which is just shade light. So it's evenly lit across the surface. And I've tapped on the strawberries to focus and I brought down the exposure to the appropriate amount and then taken the photo and what you end up with is this just lush looking strawberries with even lighting all the way across and it's just a very simple fix to get a much better photo. This is a great example of a case where the brag of no filter would be no brag at all. The sensor took a look at the, this grass which was a beautiful golden color and it thought there's no way the grass could be that golden and it sucked all the color out of it when I took the picture. So what I ended up needing to do is adjust the white balance with the camera. The second image isn't post-processed at all. This is no filter. This is just me fixing the, the white balance within an app while I was taking the photo. And this is what the grass actually looked like. And there is a, an activity in the sheet, the lesson plan that teaches you how to do this, how to adjust white balance while you're taking the photo. It makes a world of difference. This is an example of just something as simple as making sure that the color of the plate is accurate and how much of a difference it makes in making something like food look accurate and how much more delicious it looks. Many people think that bright sunny days are the best for photos because they love sunny days the best, but harsh overhead light can cause a lot of problems for photos 
not just because of squinting, but particularly because strong shadows are cast. Bright sunlight can also reflect off of plants and objects, which leaves your landscape photos looking pale and washed out. This is why things can look more colorful in photos on an overcast day. Some smartphone cameras and apps will try to compensate for this by using a mode called HDR mode, where it takes several photos in quick succession in a variety of exposures across a range and then averages them out. And this can give you a decent approximation sometimes and rescue what would have been a failed photo, but it also takes control away from you as a photographer. It's great in a pinch, but it doesn't help you learn to improve your technique. So in these photos here, you can see this was taken in direct overhead sun and you can't see the, the eyes and there's harsh sunlight on the cheeks and you can't really fix this but this was taken in indirect light it's a lot the light is a lot softer and so you can see eyes and the same thing comparing these two photos um, the light is a lot softer and more gentle and so you can see expressions and taking people out of the direct sun and moving them into the shade is a, a much better way to go about things and you learn to move around, so it can be easy to get set in your ways and just take photos from the same angle all the time, but try to look at subjects from different angles. And there's an activity that helps move you out of those, those same, standing in the same position all the time. And when a photo doesn't express what you mean it to, you need to rethink it. Um, the main leaf in this photo was super huge and I wanted to try to, get that across, but when I took the photo, it just looks like a leaf. And so I had to think, how can I show how huge this leaf was? So I didn't have anyone else to stand next to it. So I put my hand next to the leaf to try to get across just how big it was. This is an example of a photo that employs the rule of thirds in a couple of ways. It took me longer to wrestle the line of pairs in a row than it did to take the photo, post-process it and share it online. And so the rule of thirds, so you break this up into a grid, and so it's along the, the lower line, and then the one pair that's out of sequence is along this other line and where these two lines intersect. And it's on a dark table with a chalkboard background. So I tapped on the pairs to expose or to focus them, brought down the exposure, and uh, that's really all there was to taking this photo. And I also want to mention that the smartphone being used was an iPhone 4S or 5S, which is proof that you don't have to have the latest gear to take a photo of something beautiful. And uh, just to encourage you that if you have an older phone, you can still take beautiful photos. A very important thing to know is that digital zoom on smartphones is very low quality and just will result in a loss of detail. It is much better to just take the photo as is and crop it afterwards. If you have a phone that has two lenses on the back, one with a zoom lens on it, you can use that. That's called optical zoom and uses a special lens to zoom in. That's fine, but if you're zooming by pinching your fingers and dragging them, that's called digital zoom. And I just recommend not to do it at all. It's better just to take the photo, like I said, and crop it and you'll get much sharper, more detailed photos. Um, this is an example of zooming by cropping instead of zooming in camera. Um, I also loved this photo, the moment that was happening in the photo, but it's obviously a terrible photo. There's all sorts of junk in the foreground and lots of distracting color. So I cropped it, turned it into black and white to get rid of some of the distractions and noise going on. Uh, another example or an example of how to take a not great photo and turn it into something better. And also to point out, you don't need to have unusual subjects or locations to take a photo of something interesting. People have been editing photos since the early days of film. They just did it in the dark room using chemicals and time. When you're using an app, you're using software to do the same thing. Just think about what you're trying to express when you're editing your photos and uh, stay true to that. You can edit each photo with a series of steps or tap on a single preset or filter, um, which is a saved combination of settings. Be cautious with filters and editing. Some settings will push the image so far that you lose details. For instance, too much contrast or exposure may result in blowing out the highlights or result in a loss of detail in the whites. You can easily end up with solid blocks of unnatural color instead of realistic gradients. 
photos can start to look gimmicky, which can also be fun or maybe an intended look for a particular project. But in general, it's not good a good practice to apply across all of your images. And the take home handout has a list of free apps to try out for Android and Apple phones. So some things to remember, don't trample on delicate nature to get a photo, stay off private property, put your phone away during things like wedding ceremonies and special events. Be mindful of cultural etiquette. Some ceremonies or artifacts are forbidden to have photographed in other cultures. You know, remember to print your photos. Don't just let them sit on a hard drive somewhere and be forgotten.